how many of you would like to have a legal resource of somebody that you could call and say, tell me about that constitutional county thing and how do we have it have teeth? How do we make that an ordinance and not just a resolution? Anybody interested in that? Well, my next guest, Christina, and I don't want to butcher her name. I told her I was going to really try hard, but I believe it. Heuer? Heuser. Heuser. Okay, I, 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 I mea culpa. I, I, I still couldn't get it right. But anyway, Christina is the attorney that wrote the Collier County resolution that she and Chris Hall were able to get through and that Sheriff Rumbaugh uh, approved and, and supported and all those types of things. And the Collier County has got to be the poster child for probably one of the best counties, if not in Florida, the nation. Let's hear it. They have done more to protect the rights of their people than anybody that I can think of. And I can't think of any better introduction I can give you to Christina. Christina, come on up. And I'd love to have you let these people know how they can do it, too. Thank you, that's very kind. Um, so yes, I'm Christina Heuser. Everybody butchers my last name, so I'm used to it, so don't worry about it, Bill. Um, and I am an attorney. I focus my practice in the area of civil rights and constitutional law, particularly defending religious liberty. So I love the Lord, and I love the Constitution, and that drives everything that I do. Um, and I also, just want to say, since I have you guys as a captive audience, sort of off topic, if you live and vote in the state of Florida, please vote no on Amendment 4 on Election Day. The language of that proposed amendment is intentionally deceptive and it will allow for abortion through the time of birth and everybody needs to know that. So please take that message to your churches, your communities, we need to defeat that. Um, so now what I'm really here to talk about. I did author the Bill of Rights Sanctuary County Ordinance, not resolution, ordinance that was passed in Collier County. Um, but I did not act in a vacuum in getting that done. So I'm very honored to be here to present what we did there and how we were successful. But I'm not here to take credit for that and I wanna be very clear about that. It was a team of us and I will get into that. But I do wanna help. So if you all are interested in what I present here and this is something that you wanna to try to do in your county, I'm happy to serve as a resource to you um, because we all share the same goal and that is to protect our fundamental rights and liberties that were given to us by God and thankfully, thanks to our founders, enshrined in our Constitution. Um, and I also wanna thank all of you here that are in law enforcement. I have a great deal of respect for you and I really am honored to be here and speak to you. So this presentation was teed up really nicely by some of the speakers that came earlier. Um, I had never heard of this organization or met Sheriff Mack prior to yesterday, um, but the origin of our ordinance and the underpinnings of it really came from his case. And I'm going to, in a little bit here, read to you some of the whereas clauses, one of which actually quotes that Supreme Court decision. So it's really nice how this all came together seamlessly, and it's just another illustration of how God's hand really is on everything, because we didn't know each other, and actually I was just talking at the table with our commissioner and his lovely wife about how our ordinance reflects these principles, but we didn't talk to each other, we didn't do that intentionally, but this is the law, so this is something that every county can do, and it is firmly rooted in the Constitution. Um, so this is intended to be like a practical how-to. Um, so this started in our county in 2021, and there were some citizens that had heard about sanctuary, um, the Second Amendment Preservation Act or sanctuaries being done in some counties, 
and they wanted to do that in Collier County. So they approached the county attorney and they were shot down immediately. No, 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 we can't do that here. Um, actually, the county is preempted by state law in the area of guns and ammunition. That's what they were told. So those citizens looked for help and they went to Keith Flaw, who's here at this front table, who is the founder and director of Florida Citizens Alliance, which is a wonderful organization that does great grassroots work throughout the state, and he happens to live in Collier County. Um, and then he came to me and said, hey, can you help us? So I was blessed when I moved to Collier County in 2019 to be introduced to Keith, and we had a working relationship. So I said, sure, how can I help? I'd love to help. So he told me the situation, and I went to work doing some research. I confirmed that, in fact, what the county attorney had told them was true. So I tried to look for a workaround. What can we do here to protect our constitutional liberties, but respect the constraints that the county commission has? So what we decided to do was expand it to not just a Second Amendment, um, sanctuary, but a Bill of Rights sanctuary county. And I can't entirely take credit for that idea myself because I looked on Google and I found that this had actually been done in another county in Arkansas. So I borrowed some of that language, but to make sure that I could not be shot down by the county attorney or by the Board of County Commissioners, I made sure to do my research and find um, all of the legal precedent, whether it was statutory or case law, that I could put into this ordinance so that it was impenetrable and it could not be shot down, and I feel that we accomplished that. So, um, and another thing I want to say about the, the title, and it, this was alluded to earlier, the idea of having a sanctuary county kind of um, triggers some people. We like to use that word these days uh, because we know there are sanctuary counties um, that don't allow the federal government to deport illegal aliens. And personally, I thought it was like very poetic that we could borrow the verbiage that the left has used and ram down our throats and use it for our own purposes. And when they try to tell us, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. You have to listen to the federal government. That's illegal. That's unconstitutional. Well, you guys have sanctuary counties and it's fine. And in fact, that has been challenged in the courts and upheld. So I kind of like to use their idea and turn it on its head for our purposes. So I'm gonna read um, some of the ordinance to you. Whereas the Collier County Board of County Commissioners has growing concerns over the federal government's increasing encroachment on the rights and privileges of its citizens, and whereas of particular concern are those edicts being promulgated by the federal government in the form of executive orders, which circumvent the legislative process and arguably violate the fundamental American doctrine of separation of powers. Whereas Article 1, Section 1 of the Florida State Constitution recognizes that all political power is inherent in the people, and whereas the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America states, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Whereas federalism protects the liberty of the individual from the arbitrary power and an individual has a direct interest in objecting to laws that upset the constitutional balance between the national government and the states when the enforcement of those laws causes injury that is concrete, particular, and redressable. Fidelity to principles of federalism is not for the states alone to vindicate. And that's a quote from Bond versus United States, a Supreme Court decision that came after Sheriff Mack's case. Whereas the structural principles secured by the separation of powers protect the individual as well. 
Whereas the state of Florida is divided into various counties and municipalities, and Article 8, Section 1F of the Florida Constitution vests counties with such power of self-government as is provided by general or special law. Whereas Chapter 125.01 Florida Statute specifically authorizes counties to adopt ordinances and resolutions necessary for the exercise of its powers, and perform any other acts not consistent with law, which acts not inconsistent with law, which acts are in the common interest of the people and of the county and exercise all powers and privileges not specifically prohibited by law, whereas Chapter 125.01 Florida Statutes further provides that the provisions of this section shall be liberally construed in order to effectively carry out the purpose of this section and to secure for the counties the broad exercise of home rule powers authorized by the state constitution, whereas neither the United States Congress nor the executive branch of the federal government has the authority to commandeer the states to act, and that's taken from Murphy versus National Collegiate Athletic Association, a Supreme Court case, whereas the anti-commandeering principle is absolute and categorical, that comes from Prince and Matt versus United States. It matters not whether policymaking is involved and no case-by-case -case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. And, two more, Whereas Congress exceeds its authority relative to the states, therefore the departure from the constitutional plan cannot be ratified by the consent of state officials. That's from New York versus United States. Whereas the Board of County Commissioners acknowledges and affirms that the sheriff is an independent constitutional officer and not under the authority of this board, but the sheriff is charged with the duty to enforce county ordinances. So the reason that I read that, and thank you for bearing with me, I hope it wasn't too boring, <laughs> is because it was important, I felt, to let the county commissioners know that this is within your authority to do. Because the commissioners are listening to their county attorney, and in our case, and probably in many cases, the county attorney doesn't want to do anything that's going to take them out on a limb. He doesn't want them to do anything that could potentially subject the county to lawsuits. So he's doing his job, but he's very timid, and we need bold leaders if we are going to take our country back and protect our freedom. So we drafted the ordinance, and then the next thing that we needed to do was build a coalition of people who were going to help us go to the commissioners and get this passed. And we needed at least one commissioner who was going to be willing to bring this ordinance forward. So we had to attempt this twice. The first time we had a commissioner who's not here today, his name's Bill McDaniel, and he introduced the ordinance for us. And this was right after COVID, kind of still during COVID, but after the height of COVID. So we kind of knew at that point where everybody stood on the county commission. So going into it, he knew that it was most likely to be defeated because we had three pro-maskers, pro-shutdown, so we figured, well, they don't really like the Constitution or care about our rights, so we kind of knew where they stood. But we wanted to do this anyway and at least get everybody on the record as to where they really stand when it comes to individual liberty. Um, we also went to our sheriff and we asked if he would support it. Our sheriff's name is Kevin Rambosk, and he's a great sheriff, and he said to us, you know, and he said this to the Board of County Commissioners at the hearing, how could I not support it? I am the sheriff, I'm charged with upholding the Constitution, and that's all this ordinance does, so how could I not support it? So he was a great help. And this is something, a uh, point I want to make that was also alluded to earlier. I think sometimes in grassroots activism and kind of because of the national narrative that we hear, 
you know, we're quick to demonize elected officials, especially people who've been in office for a long time, and say maybe, you know, they're not with us or call them other disparaging names. But the reality is that politics really gets done through relationships. And it's really helpful if you can form relationships with your elected officials. And typically, we don't do that effectively when we're calling people names and disparaging them. So I would advise you to you know, certainly express your disagreement if you have a disagreement, but try to do so respectfully and have thoughtful conversations so that you can preserve that relationship. So when you want them to do something for you and you need them on your side, they're not writing you off immediately. They're willing to do that because you've developed that rapport and relationship with them. So the difference between an ordinance and a resolution is key. So what I read to you were the whereas clauses, and that's just teeing up the ordinance, like, hey, guys, hey, county commissioners, this is why you have the authority to pass this. But then it goes on to um, recite the first 10 amendments to our Constitution, commonly known as the Bill of Rights, and then it defines an unlawful act. So an unlawful act shall consist of any federal act, law, order, rule, or regulation which violates or unreasonably unre restricts, impedes, or impinges upon an individual's constitutional rights, including but not limited to those enumerated in amendments 1 through 10 to the United States Constitution. Any such unlawful act is invalid in Collier County and shall not be recognized by Collier County and shall be considered null, void, and of no effect in Collier County, Florida. The next section sets forth prohibitions. Notwithstanding any other law, regulation, rule, or order to the contrary, no agent, department, employee, or official of Collier County, a political subdivision of the state of Florida, while acting in their official capacity, shall intentionally participate in any way in the enforcement of any unlawful act, or utilize any assets, Collier County funds, or funds allocated by any entity to Collier County in whole or in part to engage in any activity that aids in the enforcement or investigation relating to an unlawful act. So this is based upon the anti-commandeering doctrine and it makes it illegal for any officer or elected official within Collier County or just ordinary employee, any Collier County agent, official, employee um, to participate in carrying out any unconstitutional order or mandate of the federal government. Now, the key is that it's enforceable. It has penalties, and that's the difference between an ordinance and a resolution. A resolution is effectively just a statement. We support the Constitution, but then when they don't, there's no repercussions. So ours has a penalty section. There are two parts of it. There's a civil penalty and a criminal penalty. So the civil penalty, allow, it says anyone within the jurisdiction of Collier County accused of being in violation of this ordinance may be sued in circuit court for declaratory and injunctive relief, damages, and attorney's fees. So any person can have standing in the local court, which is a pro se friendly court, um, to go in and sue the county if they are violating this ordinance, meaning if they are participating in carrying act, out any unconstitutional law, order, or mandate of the federal government. And they're not just suing for money, although that's an option too, but they can sue for declaratory and injunctive relief, meaning they can ask the court for an order directing the county to cease and desist whatever unlawful act they're engaged in. Secondly, there's a criminal penalty that just is in accordance with violation of any other county ordinance. Um, so, as I mentioned, we put this to a vote in 2021, and unfortunately, the commission voted no, three to two, and what they did, they had prepared already in their back pocket a resolution 
doing exactly what I alluded to before. Oh, well, we support the Constitution, and they voted unanimously in support of that. But that does nothing, and we know they don't support the Constitution because they voted no on our ordinance. They didn't want to be held accountable for violating people's rights. Well, we didn't quit there, and persistence is another important thing that you need to keep in mind when you're doing this type of work. So we put our heads together and we decided, you know what, we need to get rid of those lefty commissioners. <laughs> They've showed their true colors and now they need to go. So fortunately, two of the three were up for re-election in 2022 and we went to work and we were blessed because some great people stepped up. We didn't find them, but they stepped up. And one of those people you're going to hear from right after me, his name is Chris Hall. He's now the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. And I was so happy to get acquainted with him at the time because he is a man of God. He is a true patriot. And I'm just so blessed that he is my commissioner. So we were able to get those two leftists out of office and replace them with two God-fearing patriots. And actually during that process, um, because we vetted candidates with Florida Citizens Alliance and Christian Family Coalition, and we specifically asked them, if you are elected, will you agree to bring forward, not just vote for, but will you bring forward our Bill of Rights Sanctuary County Ordinance? So we got them on the record saying, yes, we will do that. And credit to Chris Hall, he kept his word. And uh, we, after he was elected, we presented him with it, he brought it forward, and this time we won, and the ordinance was approved four to one. We still have one leftist we need to get rid of. So no one's telling me how much time I have left, so I'll just keep. <laughs> Okay, great. So I just want to address a couple of the objections that we heard because we did have, although we are a conservative community, or at least they like to tell us that we are, um, there are, everyone calls themselves a Republican, but we certainly have a bunch of left-leaning Republicans. Um, so the people that came out in force to oppose this effort actually was the League of Women Voters, believe it or not. Um, and they told the commissioners, you can't do this because this violates the supremacy clause and this is nullification. So of course we reiterated, well first with respect to the supremacy clause, and we heard this earlier, um, only those federal laws that are in pursuance of the Constitution are valid and enforceable and can be regarded as supreme to state law. And I'll read to you this quote so you don't have to take my word for it, um, but this is from actually the um, Prince Mac case where the court said, the supremacy clause, however, makes the law of the land only laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution. So the supremacy clause merely brings us back to the question discussed earlier, whether laws conscripting state officers violate state sovereignty and are thus not in accord with the Constitution. So it's very important for you all to double down on when you're talking to your commissioners this is rooted in the anti-commandeering doctrine, and it's a doctrine that's been firmly upheld by the Supreme Court time and time again. This is not nullification. This is not a violation of the Supremacy Clause. This is pursuant to sound legal precedent. Um, the second, it's really shocking, um, the other objection that we heard, and this was from our county commissioner, um, he said, well, okay, like anything that violates the Constitution, we can't enforce it, but how am I supposed to know what violates the Constitution if the Supreme Court doesn't tell me? Yes. <laughs> so that was really disheartening, and we actually had a lot of residents get up and echo that sentiment. Um, that's really sad to me. It was never the intention of our founders that we, the people, be so alienated from the Constitution. 
but I think that was intentionally done over time because, of course, how can you defend your rights if you don't know what they are? And this also was a point that was made earlier, but I'll second it um, because I did also make this point to the commission, but they raise their hands and swear an oath to uphold the Constitution. How can you swear an oath to uphold something that you neither understand nor even believe that you have the ability to understand? So it was quite mind-boggling to me. Um, so if I have a minute left, I just want to read to you um, these two quotes from great presidents on that point about our ability to know and understand and interpret the Constitution and the importance of that, because I think that's another important takeaway. We can't just defer to the Supreme Court and uh, let them tell us what the Constitution means. So this is from Lincoln's first inaugural address, and he said, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court the instant they are made, in ordinary litigation between parties and personal actions, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. So he certainly saw the writing on the wall, the danger of the court being the arbiter of everything. And then Teddy Roosevelt said something similar. The American people must be made the masters and not the servants of even the highest court in the land and the final interpreters of the Constitution. For if the people are not to be allowed finally to interpret the fundamental law, ours is not a popular government. So now you'll hear from Chris Hall on what steps he took to get this ordinance passed. And once again, thanks for giving me your time. Appreciate it.